Good morning, church. Great to see you. Great to have you with us online. If you can't be here in the big house, drop us a line. Let us know who's out there. We want to say hello. Did you catch that last line? I am thankful for the scars. Wow. That is easier said than truly believed in practice, is it not? I am thankful. But that is perfect for what we're talking about. Because today, I've entitled my message, How Can a Good God Allow Suffering? You ever heard that question? It's a valid question. A lot of people are asking that question. You look around. So we're going to dive into that today. Let me, let me set the, the stage here. Back in the 1920s, in fact, almost 100 years ago to this day, a struggling cartoonist, animator, if you will, wanted to launch his dream. And so he launched his first venture called Laughograms Studio. Yeah, doesn't that just make you want to jump in and go watch whatever he's animating? Well, no one else did either, and it bombed. It flopped. They released several short animated things, and no one wanted to watch them. And the poor guy, who, who his name was Walter, he put his heart and soul into it. He was so fired up, and he thought this was it. And within two short years, he found himself so deep in debt, he was struggling just to make ends meet. In fact, he had a humiliating loss, and he had to go downtown and say, you know what, the whole thing has gone belly up. I need to file for bankruptcy. So he and his wife went downtown, and they kind of buried their dream and thought that was pretty much it. Fast forward a couple years, still hurting, still suffering from that early defeat. He didn't give up on his dream of animating. So he grabbed his brother Roy, and Walter attempted a second launch of a studio, hanging all his hopes instead on another bug-eyed, silly cartoon character named, wait for it, Mortimer. <laughs> yeah, people hated it. Just like that. In fact, his studio was headed for disaster yet again. Finally, his wife came to him and said, can I talk to you about, like, everything? Because, <laughs> like, you know, I love your dreams, I love your heart, I love your passion, but good night. You're, this is not for you. This is not working. I don't know what, what you're thinking your dreams are. So, for one, like, your cartoon characters are so ugly, you know? Like, you got this bug-eyed guy that called Mortimer. I mean, if nothing else, can you at least change the name and soften it, make it gentler? And he's like, well, what did you have in mind, baby? I don't know, he's better than Mortimer. I mean, how about Mickey? And with that, we saw the evolution of the next two years from ugly, bug-eyed Mortimer Mouse to soft and cuddly Mickey Mouse. And then he produced a little unknown movie called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And from there, it was off to the races. And he launched now what is known as Disney Studios, and it has become probably the most incredible studio and successful studio in the history. But think about this. It would have been so easy for Walter to quit after he had suffered that humiliating defeat, after he had sunk all his things in, after the, the struggles in his home when he could barely make ends meet, when Laugh-A-Gram Studio goes belly up, but he didn't. You know why? Because he refused to look at his present circumstances and let that dictate his future. Ooh, did you hear that? He refused to let his present circumstances dictate his future. And today, Disney stands as one of the most powerful, successful, Studios of all time. He didn't let his setback prevent what was God's setup for what was coming. So maybe you are per currently uh, experiencing a setback. Maybe you look around the state of the world, and maybe you're, you're suffering. Maybe you're even in full-blown panic mode. I get it. That's normal. A lot of people feel that way. Here we are a year ago. We had our last huge packed house. And then the world changed, as you know, one year ago this week been a lot of suffering since then. A lot of people have honestly looked out and wondered, will the sun ever shine as brightly as it used to? You know, will, will the pain end? Will, will the suffering? Maybe you look around, you see all the pain, and you wonder, where is God in all of this? It's a great question. There's nothing wrong with asking. Nothing wrong with having doubts. It's wrong to keep them, to not do anything with them. God can handle that. Today we're going to tackle a hard question, head on, straight on. We're not going to dodge it, and it's probably going to take two weeks. We're going to get to this. What about all the suffering we see? So if you're ready, open your Bible, John chapter 16, pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to be in a different translation today, hopping in and out of NIV, CSB, and uh, New King James Version. So you remember last week, Pastor Adam was with us from Family Church, and he shared from John 16 a great, great, powerful message. Today we're going to go, or John 17, today we're going to back up one chapter to John 16, and I want to set the context for what's happening here, because 
People don't realize what Jesus is really doing here. What is happening is he is setting the stage for his departure. He knows what's coming. The disciples are kind of like, I don't really understand what's going on. Chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, this is all one long story where Jesus is sharing some of the most incredible, meaty stuff of all Scripture. So Jesus is sharing this, and now we fast forward. We are in the upper room. He's called his closest disciples together, and he is having a final meal. Remember, the disciples are kind of like, it's weird, they're like something seems off, it's a, little, it's a little dark, but we think of this as only a sad and sober time because we call it the Last Supper. But Jesus is actually sharing some incredible stuff up to this point. He's talking about an eternal home in heaven. He's promising to send the Holy Spirit. It's going to be this great paraclete, this comforter to come alongside. And you're going to have an eternal salvation. And I will be with you all the way to, to the end of forever. And then he prays for the most incredible prayer. But then he says something, seven disturbing words that just kind of hang in the air. John 16, he says this, in this world, you will have trouble. And they're eating. They're like, what? Wait, we'll go back to talking about the great stuff that's coming. Like, what is this? And it's kind of out, of out of the blue. And he comes in and he says, hey, by the way, I got seven sobering words for you. In this world, you, there's no way getting around it. You're going to have trouble. And he goes on to say some good things. You know, hey, but take heart. Don't worry about it. I'll have overcome the world. But make no mistake, this hung in the air. This hung in the air like a cloud. Like, what does he mean by that? In fact, the word trouble is actually a Greek word for tribulation. It's flipsis. It's this powerful word that literally refers to terrible anguish, almost like an affliction or distress as if you have been persecuted. Kind of sounds familiar, right? You don't have to be in this world very long to see that there is pain and there's suffering and there's tribulation, and we see the persecution growing with our brothers and sisters overseas, and we wonder how long before it's on our shores here. We wonder all these things. We look around, and we see the evidence of sin and suffering, and we think, wow. So today, we're tackling this question, probably the toughest question of all, and that's this one. How can a good God allow suffering? How does he do that? I think of all the questions we have, this is probably one of the hardest ones because it's so personal. It hits us on an emotional level, doesn't it? We look around, we see the pain, we say, God, why don't you do something? Why don't we, why don't we do that, okay? So I want to show you something here. We're going to dive in, and I've got, here, you hold that. I'm going to put this on right here. You hold that. I want to ask you all a question. When you're driving down the road, <laughs> pots like chips, oh, I love it. When you're driving down the road, and you see that motorcycle cop, And he's got that radar gun, right? Listen close. Yeah. It's, it's Mercy's hair dryer. It's a little, little battery-powered pink thing, if you can't see that at home. When you're driving down the road, you're minding your own business, you're not really paying attention, and you come around a corner and you see that guy standing next to his motorcycle bike, and he's got this trained on you, and you go by, what do you do? <laughs> Wave, hit the brakes, slow all the above, Cringe, right? Why do we do that? Right? Because we know we're guilty. Because we know we're guilty. We see this guy. Now, here, here's the strange thing, right? Why don't we react that way and cringe when we're at Panera and a cop comes and stands next to us to order his bread or his coffee, whatever? How come we don't act that way at Walmart when we walk by a cop and we see him and we're like, oh, no, it's a cop. What do we do? You know, do I... We don't do that anywhere else except for when we're driving. When we look down and we have that cringing moment. That's for you, son. No, I'm kidding. When I'm driving and I look down, there's a chance that I might be going one mile an hour over the speed limit. Maybe two. There's a chance that somewhere along the line... <clears throat> I came to a stop sign, a four-way stop, and there was not another car within a mile that I didn't pause for one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, check all the directions, and slowly cross. There's a chance I might have rolled through that a little, a little slow, or maybe I only stopped for one second. See, we don't obey every law perfectly all the time, do we? Might be one mile an hour, or maybe two, maybe more. See, the thing is, we know we've broken the law. So when I look at this cop, is it the policeman making me feel uncomfortable? Is that his fault? No, it's because I know I am a lawbreaker. In that moment, I know I am guilty. It sounds so harsh, but think about this. 
Is it the policeman's fault that I'm a lawbreaker? Not at all. Is it the policeman that's making me feel guilty? No, it's my transgression that is making me feel guilty. It's, this is on me, right? But it feels so much better to blame him. <laughs> it feels so much better to blame that guy. Now think about what our knee-jerk reaction when we cringe. Think about what that says about us. Think about what it says about our world. In a very overly simplistic way, the policeman didn't create my guilt. The policeman didn't create my suffering when he pulls me over. That's on me. And in the same way, God did not create my suffering. God is not the author. He's not the creator of evil and suffering. That is not him. Don't blame the wrong guy. But how easy is it that we blame the good guy and we let the bad guy come off the hook? So a lot of people ask, well, why didn't God create a world where there was no suffering, where there was no evil? And the answer to that is, he did. He did. He absolutely did. In fact, it says right there in Genesis 1, God created the world and it was good. It was totally and 100% completely good. So where did the evil come from? Where did the bad come from? Well, the Bible tells us that when God created men and women, he created them with free will. This enabled them the ability to express love to God, but also to express love to each other. So don't miss the hidden gem right here on the origin of evil. It is truly impossible to really love someone if they don't have a choice. Okay, I want you to think about this. Y'all remember growing up, those creepy little uh, Chatty Cathy dolls you get? Anybody have one of those? Yeah, right? Aren't they creepy, right? If you're not familiar with them, you can pull this little string, and they were pre-programmed with words. They say things like, oh, I love you, mm, striper rules, and you know, I, Star Wars is the greatest movie ever. They would have all these pre-programmed sayings, right? Now, they could say the words, but unless there was a heartfelt connection to them, those words meant nothing. They were a robotic program design. That means, that means nothing unless there is a heartfelt decision behind it. You see, God wants to have a relationship with every single person that he created. That is his desire. But here's the deal. We can't truly love God without having the freedom to choose not to love God. Think about this. So God gives humans the capacity for choice. And unfortunately, humanity used its free will to disobey. It used its free will to bring about evil, to choose wrongly, to choose the wrong path. You remember the account of Adam and Eve. You look back, there they were. They had everything given to them. Paradise, all the food they could eat. They had, it was literally 72 degrees year round, this beautiful Edenic paradise. And God gives them one command and says, all this is yours. I just need you to obey one thing. Don't eat from the knowledge of tree of good and evil. That just, that's it. One. And you know the story. The serpent comes, tempted Eve. Eve ate. Adam ate. And from then on, that disobedience, sin entered the world. Humanity's free will brought about a world that was cursed with sin and affected by death. And you and I have been living with that reality ever since Eden. Now think about this. We're not throwing Adam and Eve under the bus. Okay? It's really easy to blame just them, but I promise, if that were you and I down there, we would probably do the same thing. They had everything. They had perfection, and they still fell. So think about that, okay? So we're not trying to... Every one of us has the capacity to do wrong. And when you think about it, there's actually two categories of evil that we stumble into. All around the world, we see the the first one is man-made evil. And this is the one where we do things that are selfish. We do things that hurt others. We, We stop doing the good things that could help others. All the philosophers, all the great wizards of smart around there, they estimate that 95% of all the pain and suffering in the world is a result of things humans do to one another. 95%. So it's not really fair to blame God for this. We're the ones doing these things. Humans were the ones who committed these acts. 95% of all pain and suffering is usually attributed to things we have done in our selfish flesh. We've done things, wickedness, hurtful things. The second kind of evil is what is often called naturalistic evil. This is natural evil that's in the world because it's been cursed, it's a fall. We've got like tornadoes and outbreaks of diseases and viruses and things like earthquakes. Remember, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, it brought sin and death into the world. So sin corrupted and destroyed the perfect created order. So from that, death entered the world, We know now that animals die. We see plants die. We see that things are are hurtful. Hail hurts and fires consume your lands and, and destroy homes and lives. Nowhere on earth was safe after that. 
and nowhere on earth is truly safe today. You can take every precaution. You could slather yourself in hand sanitizer. You could wear 15 masks. You could lock yourself in a bubble room and never leave. You could put on seatbelts and helmets, but you could still have a car accident. Trees could still fall. There's still tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunamis and hail and ice storms. There's all kinds of things that could still come. It never was safe. Because of the curse, everything changed. Everything. We'll go deeper into that maybe next week because there's so much I could say about this. But in Genesis 3, God teaches us that when Adam and Eve sinned, a curse fell over the earth. And ever since then, the entire creation has literally been groaning. It says as if the painful birthing of a child, literally groaning for creation, laboring here. Romans 8.20 puts it this way. It says, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, here it is, the creation is looking forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death, and decay. There it is. There it is. Creation is waiting for its redemption day, aren't you? I look around and I see people just hurting. And I say, it didn't, it didn't have to be this way, but this is the way it is since the fall of man. But God is going to redeem. See, the natural evil is what happened when the world rejected God's law. One author, great Christian philanthropist, said this. He put it this way. He says, when humans told God, we'll choose and just go do your own thing, He partially honored their request. As a result, nature was cursed, genetic breakdown began, disease began, pain and death, and everything became part of the human experience. We were tending toward decay. We see that. Science backs us up. The laws of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, things are slowing down. Things are decaying. Things are not progressing. The universe, we see it, the Milky Way galaxy is slowing down. Days are, the the earth is slowing. We see getting slightly longer. Things tend to decay and rot. Look in the mirror as we get older, what is happening? We're not getting better. Well, I mean, my wife said, but nobody, you know what I'm saying? Everything tends to slow down. It's that law of entropy. We see that. Even science confirms this, this natural thing. So someone might, might ask this. Well, pastor, I mean, wasn't God smart enough to foresee this? Like what would happen if he created a world where there's free will? Couldn't he have anticipated this and all the pain and the suffering? That's a valid question. So let's go there. We're not shy about that. Here, Potter's hand, we'll, we'll tackle it. Those of you who are parents, you faced this exact possibility when you decided to have kids. I want you to think about this. You knew that when your children were born, they might have medical issues. You knew when they were born, they might have birth defects. You knew that you could possibly have heartache and disappointment while watching them grow up. You knew that one day they might even turn on you, that they could disappoint you. In fact, you knew that there was a strong chance that as they grew older, they would hurt other people. And they would be a big disappointment to some. They might even hurt people physically. They might even go off to be somebody that ends up doing horrific acts. You, you knew all of that, yet you still chose to have children. Why? Because of love. Because of love. You choose to go ahead. You choose because you wanted to love that child. You wanted to have this relationship with him or her. You knew the downside potential. You knew that there was going to be pain and suffering and strife and heartache. But you knew also there would be love and hope and laughter and joy. And you wanted to have a relationship. You knew all these things, and y'all. You balanced them out. And knowing all that, you still went ahead. And so did God. Because he wanted that relationship. He loves you. I want to make it crystal clear. Hear me. God did not create evil. God did not create suffering. He did not create death. We love to blame the wrong guy. He created a world in which was free to choose love, to allow for the potential of evil to enter because that's what comes with free will. It was human beings and our free will who disobeyed and fall and sin and potential evil became the reality. So it helps to remember God did not create the pain and the suffering. It also helps to remember, though suffering is not good, God can use it to bring about good. God can use it to accomplish something good. There is, see, remember, God never wastes pain. There's a great philosopher named Peter Kreeft, and he teaches theology at Boston College, good Christian man, and he started noticing as he was teaching his students that all throughout history, there seemed to be a level of suffering in every single generation. And it almost like, like it took this level of pain and suffering before these nations would turn back to God, before they would repent of their evil. 
And he looked, he saw it was crazy. It was happening over and over and over. And finally, he said, it's almost as if the meaning and purpose of suffering throughout history is to force us to repentance, to lead us back to repentance. We see that with Israel. We see it with other nations. We see it in our own lives. Only after disaster did Israel turn back. And it reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12, where he says, so endure hardship as discipline. God is treating us as children. For what children aren't disciplined by their father? Think about that. When you look around and you see the pain, never forget that suffering can bring about repentance. It's one of those beautifully bizarre paradoxes where God can do something beautiful out of something terrible. Where God can take something horrific and turn it into beautiful spiritual awareness. And if you're spiritually mature and you've walked this road of suffering, you know exactly what this is. Because you feel there is nothing more valuable than an awareness of God because the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you've ever been in the hospital and the doctor gives you that diagnosis, some of you can say this is when you felt closer to God. In fact, C.S. Lewis, you all know him from the Chronicles of Narnia, but he was also known as a great Oxford professor and a strong Christian. He had this incredible quote. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Wow, think about that. See, we know this is true from life experiences because when things are going great, think about it. When it's trouble-free, we go about our bit. Wait, we don't need God. We got, man, I got gas in the tank. I got food on the table. I got clothes. I got a job. I got a wife, kid. Things are going pretty good. You know what? Oh, I forgot to thank God for that. And we go, and we go about our business because things are going pretty well. But when, oh, when the trouble hits... Oh, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Tom Cruise. Where are you? Somebody's got to help me through this. We, how, look how quickly we turn to a higher power, how much we cling to him in our suffering. It happens like clockwork. We're so much more likely to turn to him in the tough times. So Ralph Erskine, the great famous architect from the 20th century, he was lying on his bed, stricken, I believe, with cancer for the third time, and it wasn't looking good. They called it in. They said, this is his deathbed. And he made this statement. He said, I have known more of God since I came to this bed than through the rest of my entire life. He learned more about God in that time because God can use suffering to attract us to him. It can become the greatest intimate relationship building time. The truth is it is worth any price if it means coming to know God, which leads us to the next heavy truth for you today. God can use these trials to make us more like Jesus. So when you look around and you see suffering, you wonder what's going on. Look to see if God is going to use this to make something good come out of this. God can use trials to sharpen the character of his children. He can use things to bring us closer to make us more like his son, Jesus. Romans 5, 3 and 4 says this, but we will also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope. Are you kidding? Hebrews 5.8 talks about Jesus. Jesus, God's very own son. He says this. He says, he learned obedience from what he suffered. What? Jesus? He was perfect. God in human form. The incarnation, the deity, the Godhead. Jesus was perfect, yet he learned obedience through what he suffered. An innocent man. Don't miss this. God's own perfect son learned obedience through suffering. How much more can we as imperfect people need to learn obedience from what we suffer. I read a quote last week about some swimmers, and they had this friendly competition going on between the long-distance swimmers and the short-distance. Anybody swim? Yeah, ooh, man, that's a tough, that's a tough sport. And I'm like, I wonder if this quote is true. And I knew we had a swimmer in the church. I ran into Mimi Holland again. She was right behind, she's built by the baptistry because that's where water is, right? She loves to swim. And I said, hey, Mimi, I got this quote. I want to read this to you. Will you let me know if this is true? And I said, first off, is there really a competition between long distance swimmers and short distance swimmers? She said, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's friendly, but it's like, mm-hmm. I said, what are you? And she said, oh, I'm short distance. I'm a sprinter. I'm like, oh, tell me if this is true. Because I read this quote. It says that the long distance swimmers have this motto. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, as in them, they're tough. And he said, the short distance swimmers have a motto too. And this is, when the going gets tough, the sprinters get out of the water. And I looked at her and I said, is that true? She said, yeah, it's true. It's true. We do, because we're smarter. Because we realize 
We don't have to swim 18 miles to prove a point, right? She, we're fast. She said, seriously, we will leave practice, and we will feel the looks from these people looking at us because the sprinters are done. Like, we're in the car. We're going to McDonald's. We're getting a McGriddle, and they're sitting, they still got another mile to go. There's this, there's this friction, but all of them are sacrificing for their craft. Every one of them is sacrificing for their improvement, and isn't that true with your life? Almost everything we do that is worth honing in involves sacrifice whether it's your spiritual life, whether it's your physical life, whether it's exercise or, or dieting, everything we do goes to the process of involving sacrifice and trials and pain, but it's the hope of what lies on the other side. It's the hope of that suffering that God is going to use us to create something beautiful in the end. Lee Strobel, the great former atheist and, and, and investigative reporter, they made a movie about him called The, the Case for Christ. Y'all remember this. We showed this incredible guy, just super, super intellect. He said this about suffering. He says, God can use suffering to strengthen our commitment to him, to force us to depend on grace, to bind us together with other believers, to stretch our hope, to cause us to know Christ better, to lead us to repentance, and to teach us to give thanks in times of sorrow because it increases our faith and it strengthens our character. God uses this over and over, on and on, and that leads us to the third truth today. God will use bad circumstances to bring about good ends. Never forget this. Remember, God doesn't waste pain. God is not a capricious middle schooler with adolescent hormones making him go happy one day and mad the next. This is not about that. He's, he's, not, he's not that type of guy. God is doing something. And I, when I show you what, what's about to happen here with, with this story, it will open your eyes. See, the third way God accomplishes something positive out of the negatives is he's fulfilling promises that he's made. Promises throughout Scripture. The most famous one, you all know it. Romans 8, 28, right? We know that all things work together for good. Period. No, that is not what it says. But that's what we like to quote, right? It says, all things work together for good to those who love him, <gasps> comma, still not done, and have been called according to his purpose. Yeah, you got it. Because that changes everything. You've been called according to his purpose. Remember Joseph? Good night. You want to talk about a guy who was unjustly, horrendously persecuted. His brothers turned on him. They threw him down and hated him and assumed he was dead. He gets imprisoned wrongly. He's over in Egypt. And to fast forward the whole story, he is leading this country through famine. And his brothers are starry, don't even know he's alive. And they come and they have to go all the way to Egypt to find him. They don't even know it's Joseph. And they come and they're literally standing in front of him, don't know who he is. They think he's long gone, dead. And Joseph looks at them. You want to talk about fulfilling promises? Joseph looks at him and he makes this incredible statement. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what's now being done, right? He's feeding them. The saving of many lives. Y'all, that was, that was God's promise from years and years and years ago. He went through suffering, unjust circumstance, everything that could have gone wrong, this poor guy did. And here, just now, only now, at Genesis chapter 50, does he realize, oh my goodness, the world is starving because we had wisdom and saved up. We can save the world. God is using all of this. Y'all, this was God's promise. If you are committed to God, if you've invited the Holy Spirit into your life to seal your heart, to save you for the day of redemption, if Christ is your Lord, then his promises are for you. He will bring good out of your pain. He will bring good out of your pain one way or another. It may be in this lifetime where you see it, or it may be at the ultimate day of redemption. But his promises have never been broken. Perhaps the most powerful truth of them all, and this is the one I want to land on today. The day is coming when suffering will cease and all evil will be judged. We need to know that. Church, we need to know this. We need to know this hope. This is hope right here. Write this down. Because God's not slow in his promise. He knows what's happening. He sees it. This is, this is his promise. Never forget this. People will say, well, if God has the power to end all suffering and eradicate evil, why doesn't he just do it? Oh, man, these are powerful questions, Pastor. Are you sure you want to go here? This exact question, if God is so powerful, why doesn't he eradicate evil now? This exact question was asked to a pastor that I follow, a great guy named Dr. Hal Seed, and I love his answer. 
He called the guy into his office and he said, listen, this was during the time years ago when Saddam Hussein was out of control. Remember that? He invaded Kuwait and he was slaughtering his own people. He was torturing people and stealing gas. I mean, just a horrendous amount of evil. And the guy comes into to Pastor Seed's office and he wanted to know, why does God not just wipe him out? Why does he just squash him? And he said, look, here's what the Bible says, okay? It says that just because God hasn't wiped out evil yet doesn't mean he won't wipe it out someday and possibly someday soon. Well, he looked at me and said, well, why doesn't he just do it now? Pastor, people are dying. People are being tortured. People are starving. Why doesn't he just take out all the bad guys that are causing all of this? And he looked at him and he said, because of you. What? Because of me. And he looked at me. He had love in his eyes. He was full of compassion. He says, Richard, his name was Richard. He said, Richard, it's because of you. Because if God was to judge the bad in this world right now, you would end up being judged. And his eyes got big. He said, listen, if God is truly just, then he would have to take you out when he took out Hussein. He said, I, I don't understand. Why are you equating me with Hussein? What do you mean by that? So he went over a few of the admitted failures of Richard. He'd been counseling him. He knows, Richard, you've done this, and you've done this, and remember how you treated your wife? Remember what you did to your children? You remember all the pain you've caused? You remember all that? All it takes is one thing to separate us from the holiness of God, just one. But look at the list we've been able to go through. Think about this, all the pain that you have inflicted. And they looked at me, he said the most incredible sin. He says, Richard, God hasn't fully dealt with evil yet, in part because he wants to extend grace to you. I imagine you could hear a pin drop in that office. He is holding back. And then he turned to 2 Peter 3, 9, where he said this. See, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some people think he is. Instead, he is patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to have time to come to repentance. Y'all, that is the motive of a loving God. See, someday God will deal with all evil. But right now he is holding it back so that more of his children can turn to him. More of his children can say, I recognize you, Lord. I'm asking for forgiveness and invite the Holy Spirit into their heart. The truth is God is delaying cleaning up the evil in this world because some of that evil is in our family. Some of that evil is in our, our friend circle. And if we don't know the Lord, some of that evil is in us. And he is holding back history to give us a chance to repent before he judges the world. Oh, to me, that is evidence of a loving God. Think about this. A God who loves everyone here in this room. Everyone here who's listening online. He loves us so much that he sent his son to take the penalty. So no one has to. Hurling all of our guilt on the innocent back of Jesus. So that it could be dealt with. So he's holding back history. Any suffering we experience here in this life pales in comparison to knowing Jesus. Any suffering to the good that is coming, it doesn't even matter to, to compare to it what is in store, the good that is coming for his followers. So here's what we're going to do. Before we finish today, before we sing our final song, we have our, our last prayer. I want to share a story with you that I want you to take with you. And it's, I want you to open your heart. In fact, instrumentalists, you guys can go ahead and, and come up and uh, get in place. And we're going to close with this story because it is so powerful. Some of you may recognize this young lady right here. She's a horseback rider. She's a famous swimmer and diver. This is her father. They're on the beach. This is her, I believe, in her 19th summer. And she's doing what every energetic, vivacious, young 19-year-old girl does. She's enjoying a summer before going back to school. And everything is going great until later this summer her life would change when she miscalculates the depth of a pool she was diving in. This is Joni Erickson Tata, for those of you who haven't put it together. Joni Erickson Tata, on that fateful day, was paralyzed in a diving accident at the young age of 19. When she came to and the doctors were all around her, she began hearing strange new words that she had not heard before. Words like indefinite paralysis and quadriplegic. Words that scared her. She didn't understand what was going on, but when the gravity of her life and how it would never be the same began to crush in on her, she very naturally and understandably began to sink into a great depression. I get it. Her whole world changed in an instant. Totally unexpected. She was thinking about going home and, you know, attending a party with friends later that night. Think about all the things. And it was done. So now, 
45 years later, she is sharing her testimony over and over of how she came to know the Lord through this. How she came to know hope and peace in the middle of suffering. And it is so inspiring. Y'all, she labors every day just to get out of bed. For 45 plus years, battling recurring cancer, in and out of the hospital, trying to breathe, lung issues, never mind the disabilities that she has. I want you to listen to her inspiring words of what she says about learning about the God of the Bible. She says, I learned that God is not sometimes sovereign. He's all the time sovereign. I learned that he doesn't occupy the throne one day and then vacate at the next and is shocked. He is supremely in charge. Often for the purposes that we don't understand this side of heaven. But as we trust him, some of the purposes can be seen. And for me, my purpose means sharing the love of Christ from this wheelchair. She goes on to say this. I am now able to share the love of Jesus with people all over the world, and that is worth decades of life in this wheelchair. In fact, I would rather be in this wheelchair knowing God than on my feet running around enjoying life without him. How could she make that statement? How do you make such a statement when every day is a struggle just to get out of bed, where you can't even do it without a caregiver, where you have to pay somebody to come and help her just eat, help her get dressed, help her bathe, help her do everything. She can't run and play and jump and do all the things on horses that she used to do. How do you make such a statement? You know how? Because she can honestly say that her personal knowledge of the Savior has given her purpose, and it has outweighed all the pain. It outweighs the suffering that's associated with her disability. See, she understood what the Apostle Paul meant. When Paul wrote this, Paul said, I consider my present sufferings, they're not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. Not even worth comparing. This isn't to minimize her pain. This isn't to minimize her suffering. There's a lot of us here today who have deep wounds, deep scars, we see the brokenness in this world. See, here's my challenge. Our goal is to zoom out. We're so zoomed in right here on our problem, on our, aren't we? We're so focused right here. Our, our job is to have a spiritual perspective, to pull back like the Lord. Look at this from 30,000 feet and take the long view, this heavenly eternal perspective. See, this is the secret that Paul knew. And it's the secret that Joni found out. So maybe today, in our final minutes, you want to spend a minute asking God for help to lean into this truth, to embrace this scripture right here. God, would you help me to have a heavenly perspective, to see that all the present sufferings, they are not worth comparing to your glory. Like Job, I, I spoke before I knew who you were, but now I see the plan you have, and oh, I'm sorry. I'm just a pot, and I was questioning the pot maker. But now I see, I see, I saw just a shadow, but now I see the whole picture and oh my goodness. Wow. I see the tapestry now. All I saw was the back of the rug and it was just a bunch of matted knots and broken off, tied off strings. But then I come and I look at the other side and I'm, I'm in awe of what you are planning. Maybe today we need to embrace this scripture and allow him to give us this heavenly perspective. Let's pray about it. Would you bow right where you are? If you're at home, minimize the distractions and just focus on the Lord. God, would you give us your heavenly perspective? We know that you're not the, the cause of pain and suffering. We know that you have an ultimate plan. So today, God, we ask for a divine opening of our eyes that we would see that our present sufferings do not compare to what you have for us, that this is literally a vapor of life before the true life begins. God, would you help us not to miss that? Help us not to be so focused on our pain and our problems that we miss you as you are walking through our storm. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone. Thank you that you threw us the lifeline that we could know you, we could cling to you in times of suffering and trouble. Lord, I pray for my friends within the sound of my voice. I pray that you would bless them as they're in their, their deep end. Their water is rising. We feel the panic and we see the suffering and we see the pain. God, would you touch their heart and whisper peace. 
Help us to lean into your truth. You are our foundation. You are our immovable rock. And you will one day settle all accounts. You will make all things right. Help us to trust you in that. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.